Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study, eCourse Community Bible Church. Good to have you with us and also listening on uh, YouTube or Facebook. We're going to be in the book of Revelation today, Revelation chapter 3. But let me open us in a word of prayer. Let us bow our heads. Gracious Father, thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross. Jesus, for coming and shedding your precious blood and rising again from the dead. Holy Spirit, for coming and making that message true to our hearts so that we could embrace you as our Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sins and thank you for forgiving my sins. And each of us that are here, we rejoice in our so great salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bless this time that we have together. Holy Spirit, be the uh, teacher. Use this vessel. And we pray that uh, you might speak to our hearts through the word of God and enlighten our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're up to the uh, sixth of seven churches. There are seven churches that Jesus Christ is uh, speaking to in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And now we're in Revelation chapter 3. And today we're going to be looking at the church uh, to Philadelphia, the church to Philadelphia. Uh, before I do that, uh, I want to back up because I don't believe that we covered verses 5 and 6 last week. And uh, I just want to start by uh, reviewing that. Verse 5, it says of chapter 3, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Okay? That raiment is what? The righteous robes of Christ. And that would be uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verses 7 through 9, which is what the marriage supper of the Lamb and the uh, saints will be wearing is the righteous robes that Christ gives us, his righteousness. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Uh, true believers will never have their name erased from the book of life. The book of life which the Bible speaks about in uh, Revelation uh, 22. Actually, five places in the Bible speaks of the book of life. Uh, Whosoever's name is not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. But the true saints of God, and we're, we were speaking last time about the church at Sardis, the church that was dead, and yet it said in verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, even in the dead church, which have not defiled their garments. So that's hope for um, loved ones that are in churches that you and I uh, understand uh, to be dead. They're not preaching the gospel. They're the, 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 the pastors, the Sunday school teachers are not born again. Uh, but there are some that could be in that church. And... Uh, he says here, to those that overcome, you'll be clothed in white raiment. I'll not blot you out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and his angels. And that's the part that I wanted to bring up. Christ confessed my name. He's going to confess my name. Do I deserve that he should confess my name? What have I done? I can tell you uh, in my mind and in my heart throughout my life, uh, the sins the thousands of sin, th sins that have added up and how that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth me from them all, but that he should share my name, confess it before the Father. Can you imagine standing before the Father and, and he confesses your name? This is my daughter, Rhonda. This is my daughter, Erna, my son Tony, to the Father, each of you. What a blessed thing. And he's speaking to the church at Sardis, which is the church that was dead. He said, but there's somebody in that church that's alive. And you're the overcomer. And uh, we know what the Bible says about overcomers. 1 John 5, 24. Whoever is born of God, the Bible says, overcometh. And he overcomes the world, and this is the mystery that overcomes, overcomes the world, even our faith. 
So overcomers are blood-bought, born-again believers, 1 John 5, 24. And so every true believer is an overcomer, not because of your strength, but because of his. But I will confess his name, I'm back in verse 5, before my father, and watch this, before his angels. We're going to have an audience. And uh, it's going to be of the angels. Now, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, it says the, uh, about the angels, are not they all, um, it, well, actually in verse 1 of 14 of Hebrews, it says, are not they all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So there are angels that minister to our needs. And then in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, it says about the angels, it says, they look into the affairs of men, and one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the sons of men that thou visit them? Thou hast made them a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But you crowned them with honor and glory. And, and why did Christ do that? It's because he chose you and me to be what? His bride. Isn't that beautiful? And the angels, he says, I'm going to confess you before the angels. All right, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit further, um, a little bit later. Confess my name before the Father and before the angels. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. So if you're here tonight and uh, you're, you're alive, then when we read the Word of God, our heart is at attention. Our spirit is at attention. Now we go to the church at Philadelphia. And I'm going to read the first verse, and it says, Unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and no man openeth. Verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 3. Now the Greek term for Philadelphia is... Um, Phelos, Adelphos, Phelos. And we know the four Greek words. I've repeated that before. Some of you will remember. The four Greek words for love. Phileo, and that's this uh, Phelos, Adelphos. Phelos is love. And uh, it's a friendship love. And then another Greek term for love, it's the love that God has for us. It's called what? Agape. Agape. And then you've got Eros. Eros is the romantic love. And finally, Storge. Here's one you might not have heard before. That's family love. You know, the love of a child for her mother, for her father. But today we're looking at uh, the church at Philos, Adelphos, the church of brotherly love. And this is the church that uh, we're examining in Revelation chapter uh, 3. Of the seven churches mentioned in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, only two of them have no admonishment from the Lord, and this is one of them. The church at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, 8 through 11, because they had suffered great persecution and they were dying for the name of Christ and for the word of God. And so this church, God the Son, had no condemnation but only commendation. And then we've got the church at Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. Now, I remember going to Warrendale and uh, Pastor Armstrong used to say, you know, I, I, we model ourselves after the church at Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. Now that's easy to say, but I do know we did honor the word at that church. And I was just thinking recently at uh, the old Warrendale Community Church is we'd have Bible studies sometimes five and six days a week. Oh, you know what? I couldn't wait to get there. <laughs> I couldn't wait. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night. We had our Tuesday night Bible study, uh, Doug. And uh, so that, how many is that? That's four right there. <laughs> and then Wednesday night. And uh, they had a ladies Bible fellowship, I think, on Thursday mornings. And then on Friday night, the Motor City Bible Club. And on Saturday afternoons, we had youth Bible study, Pastor Jim Smith. And then Pastor Tom Malou, and he was just a teacher at the time. The Word of God, this is a word church. We're going to see that in a minute as we read on. Um, 
1 John chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. These should be a familiar passage with you. He that loves his brother abides in the light. This church is the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. And so the Christian church should be a church of those who love their brothers who abide in the light. There is no occasion of stumbling. You know what Jesus told us? If you love your neighbor as yourself, there's no occasion of stumbling because you won't do any wrong against him. But verse 11 says, but he that hates his brother is in darkness and knoweth not where he goeth because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. And there's a lesson right there. The church at Philadelphia was to be commended. It was a church of brotherly love. And could we say that about this church? And I heard during the prayers today that, uh, and I'm going to mention uh, their name, Rhonda was uh, praying about Paul and saying that he came and rescued uh, Verna. You know, she called on the phone, who am I going to call? And uh, let's call Paul. And Paul, he was able to do it. Do you know that uh, the other night somebody called him and said, Paul, uh, I locked my keys in my car. During the fellowship, he left the fellowship and he went to try to help them to get the keys out of their car. It wasn't you, Vernon. <laughs> but thank the Lord, the church of brotherly love. If you're here tonight, we love you, Tamara and uh, James and Julie, and I could go around, but uh, there'd only be one of you I might not mention, but no, I, I'm all of you. Hey, there's a lesson for us here. And do you know why Jesus Christ commended the church at Philadelphia? It's because it was a church of love. You can't get better than that. All right, a little background on uh, the city of Philadelphia. Originally uh, began as a center of Hellenism. And somebody may not know what Hellenism is. The Hellenistic period covered the period of Greek history between the death of Alexander the Great in 323 before Christ, years before Christ, and the beginning of the Roman Empire. And so this was uh, part of the Hellen Hellenistic Empire, the Greeks. And during this period, the Hellenists established Greek cities in Asia Minor, in Africa, and going beyond Asia Minor. And it promoted the culture and language of the Greeks. So before the Roman Empire, the empire that was the powerful empire was the Greek Empire, and it was ruled by Alexander the Great. And from him came four generals, and they then became uh, the leaders of the uh, Grecian Empire. So here the Hellenist uh, movement, the Greeks moved into this area in Asia Minor called uh, uh, Philadelphia. And uh, this city was also called Little Athens, Little Athens. All right, that's the background. So let's look a little further here. It says, the angel uh, of the church of Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I'm gonna start the first part. These things saith he who is holy. Jesus begins each uh, of his, uh, what do we call epistles, each of his epistles to the church describing parts of his character and his deity. He is holy. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy, saith the Lord. That it should also, along with love, be the two greatest marks of the believer. Holiness. Holiness and love. Jesus says who is holy, who is true, which means the truth is important. In John chapter 14, verse 6, you know the verse, I am the way, the what? Truth. The truth and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. So he is true, he says, and that's John chapter 14, verse 6. And then he says, he who has the key of David. Now listen, every time in scripture where you hear the word key, it's speaking about authority. You know, um, there are a few people who have keys to this church. And uh, they can come in here whenever they have the key in their hand. They can come into this church. You gotta know the uh, uh, alarm system number. Yeah. <laughs> um, because the police sometimes have been out here in a period of two minutes. 
if they can't get in touch with me or Paul, uh, then they'll uh, uh, call the police and the police will be out here because they'll say somebody's uh, gotten into that church. Uh, but if you have a key now, you can open the door and it's the same at your homes. And so now, what is he speaking about here? It says, he who has the key of David, this is speaking of himself. This is, this is Christ Jesus. He says, I've got the key of David. And David, the line of David was the line that uh, was uh, the kings that were in charge uh, uh, and will be in, uh, lead right up in, unto the, the line of the lineage of David, will lead right up to the millennium. And David will rule with Christ in the millennium. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? If he shuts it, no one can shut it, open it. And if he opens it, no one can shut it. Amen. And that is um, omnipotence. That's one of the descriptions to him. Uh, you say, well, you know, what about Satan? No, Satan, he, he couldn't even begin to attempt to open what Christ has closed or close what Christ has opened. Let me give you the verses here. This is, uh, was a prophetic uh, verse in Isaiah 22, verses 20 through 23. Isaiah 22, 20 through 23. Listen what it says. And it will come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall be able to shut, and none shall be able to open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Worse hearing this prophetically, Isaiah was seven centuries in, in writing before Christ. And uh, now Christ has come and hear of Isaiah chapter 22 verses 20 through 23. Here Christ identifies himself prophetically at the Fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah. You know that the prophecies in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. Otherwise, the Word of God is not inspired. There's not a single error in the Word of God. And so he's fulfilled this. Essentially, the one with all authority. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, and listen, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Isn't that what it says here uh, in Isaiah? It says, uh, and I will lay upon, uh, it says, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. And so um, it's speaking prophetically about Jesus Christ. All right. Um, we're talking here about an open door. Now, has the door of evangelism been closed in China? Actually, no. Uh, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. We can all use this verse together. You know what it is? Uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. Right. Who strengtheneth me. You know what? Christ has the door of evangelism open. Today. And no man can shut it. There are those who have tried. I think that... Uh, during the first and second century, uh, one of the Caesars had uh, uh, gone to every church it could find and they destroyed all the Bibles as much as they could. They killed all the pastors. They put down, they uh, destroyed all of the buildings. And it was during the first and second century that it was the closest that anyone ever came to ridding the world of the scriptures. But what did the Christians do? Before the guards could come in and find their Bible, they became wise to what was happening and they'd take pieces of the scriptures. And it wasn't a Bible, it was a scrolls. They'd take pieces of the scriptures, a page of the scripture, a page of the scripture, a page of the scripture, and they would pass it out. 
And they would go to their homes and they would hide those pieces of scripture. When they'd be together, they'd bring that scripture with them and uh, that piece of parchment with them. And that's why we have uh, some say uh, 25,000 and some say 40,000 pieces of manuscripts uh, that uh, we have uh, discovered, that we have found. And you say, why, why would you just have a piece or a page of a manuscript? And that's why. Because during the first and second century, they tried to stamp out Christianity. And um, uh, it didn't happen, did it? Well, listen, God's got the door of evangelism open. Let's use it. I was praying today. I was praying today. I said, Lord, there's, uh, if, if you'll give us uh, four more years of freedom where, where, where we freely go out and evangelize, then we're going to pray as a church that we take advantage of it. But if you decide that uh, it's time for us to be under some kind of persecution, somebody tries to stop us from uh, evangelizing or standing up for Jesus Christ or for the word of God, then so be it, we will stand by God's grace. But that door is open. The door to evangelize the world. Now, this brings to memory or to mind historically, listen, as Britain went, I, I, I got a minor in history when I was at uh, Wayne State University. That was my, my uh, kind of like my major uh, at um, uh, Wayne State University. And I reflected back that as Britain went and established colonies throughout the world, Christian missionaries accompanied them into the new world. Wherever they went, and Britain went around the world, they took missionaries with them. There were always missionaries with them. And uh, the countries were filled with, that they went to were filled with paganism, uh, heathenism, uh, abominable pagan rituals. And this opened the door to evangelism all over the world because, listen, God had saved man through Noah and his family. And he sent them out, and uh, they went out to the different parts of the world, but it didn't take long before uh, much of the world had forgotten God again. And so here we see that in the 15th and the 16th and the 17th and the 18th, starting with the Reformation, and uh, particularly in the 17th century and the 18th century, we see the gospel going out, and it's going out now with Britain as they're going around the world, and they are establishing colonies uh, in, in, in the pagan uh, parts of this, of this world, and the, the uh, ministers of the gospel are there to share the gospel. And it went all over the world. And uh, history records that the sun never stopped shining around the world on the British colonies, meaning that there was never a time that the sun wasn't light lighting upon one of the colonies that had been established by the British. So think with me for a minute, a godless world that was afforded the opportunity now to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about that. It was Britain, they went around the world, and with them they took missionaries. And this was especially true from the, like I said, the 1700s through the 1800s. And this is the Philadelphian period. Remember how we said that each one of the churches stands for a period of time. We're not gonna go through the other uh, five churches up to this point, the Laodicean period being the last period. But there are those scholars and Bible study teachers that believe that the period is from possibly from the 1500s through 1950, the Church of Philadelphia, where it was the Reformation, and we, 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 we know the leaders of the Reformation, John Calvin, William Tyndale, uh, Luther, Zwingli, John Hus, uh, many others that began now to say, solus fidea, and that's by faith alone, solus scriptura, and that is scriptures alone. And uh, so the truth came back into the world and then it went out uh, to parts of the world with missionaries. And this was during the Philadelphian period, which uh, 1500 through 1950, they said, when the gospel began to deteriorate and become watered down. And that sounds like uh, Laodicea, doesn't it? It began during those periods. Oh, you still had the Philadelphian church. 
We still have the Philadelphian church today, but they are a small minority of the church that still have the true gospel, that are still going out, that still want to be missionaries, that still want to preach the word of God. That's the Philadelphian church. And uh, it was during this period which, of course, led to the beginning of uh, the Laodicean periods, which permeates our world today. But this period, in the 1700s and the 1800s, uh, think with me if you remember these names. Listen, Hudson Taylor, apostle to China, the first uh, 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 indigent missionary from England that went to China and paid the price to establish the gospel. Lottie Moon was uh, one of the missionaries. Uh, William Carey to India opened the doors. Uh, uh, by the way, William Carey wrote um, uh, many, many, uh, he, he, I, I, don't, I don't mean that he wrote, he interpreted the Greek into many, many languages of the, uh, the Greek and Hebrew, the many, many languages in India uh, so that they could understand the gospel. Then you got David Livingston in Africa. Then you have Indonoram Judson, Burma. Then you've got David Brainerd, North American Indians. Many missionary societies that were formed with tens of thousands of missionaries that got excited because of these men and women of God that went out. This is the Philadelphian church. All right. And then it goes on in verse 8. It says, For thou hast little strength. Uh, the Christian life and service can only be accomplished by Christ. If we try to serve Christ in our strength, then we will fail miserably. Can I give you a couple verses? Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things. How? Through Christ, who strengthens me. It's the only way we can do this. I can't go out, you can't go out, and do what Christ would have us to do, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Zechariah 4, 6. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, not by power, but by what? My spirit, saith Jehovah God. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, not by how much money. I don't care if you're a billionaire. You can't reach this world except by the spirit of God. And then Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God through faith and to salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, Romans 1, 16. So, if you're out and you want to experience the power of God, then you share the gospel and the word of God, for it is the power of God, the gospel. Okay? Uh, then the, the, uh, another part of uh, verse uh, 8c. It says to the church, not only are you the evangelist, not only we've got this open door, and not only have you covered the world, and they did, but thou hast kept my what? Word, verse 8. Thou hast kept my word. All right, I want you to think about this. Uh, how do we know his word? Jesus is saying to the church at Philadelphia, you've kept my word. What does that say? Somehow, somewhere, someone must have preserved his word. Amen. We don't hear the voice of Christ out loud today as John did when he was writing these uh, uh, chapters in the uh, book of Revelation. How do we know his word? Well, listen, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, uh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing... 2 Timothy 2.15. How about this one? The Word of God. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, and then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1.8. The Word of God. 
Before you ever let it come out of your mouth, it must first be in your heart. Amen. As the Bible says, meditate upon it day and night. All right, and then the last part of verse 8 says this. And it says, and has not denied my name. Wow, here's a church, isn't it? Yeah. They're out evangelizing. They've got the word of God. And here it says, they will not deny Christ. There is no common, there is no condemnation to this church, no admonishment, but all commendation. You have not denied my name, and let me give you uh, uh, these verses, and because of the uh, uh, time, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Listen what this says. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Whosoever confesses me before men him will I confess also before my Father who is in heaven. I'm starting there. I'm not done. But that's verse 32. This was the church at Philadelphia. Of course, I'm quoting from Matthew 10. Jesus is speaking here as well. Whoever confesses me before men, are you confessing Christ before men? Do you have a track on you? I, I tried to, uh, I, you know, when I leave the house, I try to remember to have a track or two on. And then I try, and you know, sometimes I'm around people and I'm passing or whatever, and I'm thinking, gee, I wish I had a tract so that I could share the gospel with somebody uh, that we don't have a chance to sit down or uh, talk to. But if you are confessing Christ, then he says, I will confess you before my Father. Isn't that what he said to the person that was alive at Sardis? And I said, I'd come back to this. But I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. He that overcomes, and here it says, he that confesses me before men. Aren't you excited about the next opportunity to be able to talk with someone about Christ? Because when you're talking with somebody about Christ, you're using the word of God, and the Bible says that it is the power of God. The gospel is the power. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God. But wait a minute. And this is my last uh, verse, is Matthew chapter 10 and verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father, who is in heaven. I will deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Wouldn't that be sad? Someday we're going to stand before the Lord. If you're saved, uh, it's, we won't stand before the white throne judgment and be judged for our sins. Because Christ took our, our sins at the cross. The great verse that we read in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse uh, 21, He, God, made him Christ to become our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As I sit here, I don't deserve this. As you sit there, you don't deserve this. But he has taken my sins. And Hebrew says, the guilt of my sin. Can you imagine not just taking our sin, but the guilt? Christ took your sins upon himself at the cross. And he paid for them. And there was an exchange that was made. The moment that you got saved. He gave you his righteousness. And when we get to heaven, it's not going to be based upon our good works or how many things that we did or how much money that we gave. And thank God if we do things, thank God if we give things that we can, as Christians, yield it to the Lord. There will be rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for faithful labor. But we're not saved by our works, but by God's grace. And he paid, he took your sins, he paid for it. And he gave us the righteousness of God in Christ. And so we don't have to worry about whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. But if you are confessing Christ, and a blood-bought, born-again believer is an overcomer, we said the verse, uh, 1 John 5, 24, is an overcomer. Otherwise, you're not a Christian. And uh, uh, if you're out and sharing the gospel because that's what's on your heart. Nobody needs to tell you that that's what you have to do. Your heart's telling you that. Because yeah. you're born again. Uh, it's natural. Of course, it's supernatural. And uh, so we're going to close there today uh, at the end of verse 8. We'll pick up at verse 9 next uh, time. Let us pray. Father, thank you.
we're looking at the church at Philadelphia. We know you that you have. It's a church of brotherly love. It's a church where the doors open. The gospel is open and no man can shut that door. No, no being can shut that door. And Father, while it's open, help us to be like the church at Philadelphia and go out and share the word around the world. Thank you for people like our missionaries that to go out and help us to be able to fund them and also, also to go out with them. And we pray about our mission outreach, the Christmas winter outreach, which is coming up, up in December. Father, to be able to get the gospel and to see souls saved in these dark days. And that's our prayer. And the Church of Philadelphia as well, to keep the word of God and to know that that is the power that we can use that will free men's and women's, boys and girls' hearts as we share the gospel through the word of God. We're going to love you, we're going to praise you, we're going to thank you, and we are going to confess your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.